when you're you're in such a hard, awful place, when you're questioning everything and you're questioning God and you're questioning your faith and you're questioning your father and who made you go to church and then was the opposite of, of a Christian, to have people actually love and care for you from that place spoke volumes to me. Welcome to the Jesus Calling Podcast. Today's guest, Carrie Rawson, had her identity ripped from her at 26 years old when authorities arrested her father, Dennis Rader, who pled guilty in 2005 to being the notorious BTK serial killer. Through her tremendous faith, Carrie found the strength to forgive the man who ruined eight families, including her own, and the courage to tell her story, first through ministry and now in her book, A Serial Killer's Daughter, My Story of Faith, Love, and Overcoming. Hello, I'm Carrie Rawson, and um, I'm primarily a wife and a mom, a stay-at-home mom, but I've also been involved in women's ministry, and um, I'm the daughter of Dennis Rader, who is also known as the BTK serial killer, who was arrested in 2005 in Wichita, Kansas, which is uh, where I grew up. Before 05, we were pretty much what you consider a normal American family uh, with a three-bedroom ranch and the flowers in our yard and a garden. I have an older brother who's three years older than me. We went on a lot of family vacations. We went fishing and camping a lot with my dad. We went to church every Sunday with my family, just pretty much a typical, normal Midwestern family. We just didn't know until my father was arrested that he had been living a double life from the mid-70s on. My father lived one life as as a husband and a father. He worked as like a security salesman, and he volunteered with the Boy Scouts as a leader, and he volunteered at our church um, as an usher. He was actually the church president when he was arrested. So you have this one solid, decent person that you know that's raised you. And then on the other side, he um, committed 10 murders between 1974 and 1991. The police had been looking for him in Wichita for 31 years. And he had communicated with the police in the 70s had sent letters to the media and the police. And then he stopped communicating in 79 when I was one. And then he started communicating again in 04. By 2004, I was married and living in Michigan. And I heard about this going on back home, but of course, in no way would I have thought it was my father. And then the FBI showed up at our house in February of 05, and showed up at my apartment and knocked on the door. And, asked me if I knew who BTK was, that's the acronym my dad goes by, and then told me my dad had been arrested as BTK. I had heard about it in 04 when my dad had become public again, through the news, through media, online, but I had never heard the acronym. Very early on, when the FBI agent was in our home, I told him they had the wrong man because they had arrested the wrong guy two months before in Wichita. So I was defending my father and showing them the photo of him taken at church for the directory that was on my wall in a suit. And I was trying to defend my father and say, you know, he's this upstanding citizen that leads Boy Scouts and volunteers at church and takes care of his mother that's elderly. And I was trying to say, you're so wrong about my dad. Then like doubt would creep in because like, um, our neighbor lady had been murdered down the street when I was six, and it had never been solved. So it, that hit me when I was sitting there on the couch talking to the agent, and I told him that. And then later on that weekend, we found out that my dad had, my dad was wanted for that murder too, but they never, the police hadn't had that one on him before. So there's these things that creep in your memories or you're trying to piece together the man you knew and the life you knew with what you're being told. But you're like in physical shock. You can't sleep. You're not eating. And so I was, I was in physical shock for five days until I, got, I was able to travel back to Kansas to be with my family. After everything happened with my dad, the only thing left was God to cling to. The first night, 
Um, I didn't know how I was going to survive the night, and I didn't have any strength to pick up my Bible. I just let it fall to the floor. But I remember just crying out to God, and like Psalm 23 started running through my head. You know, even though I walked through the valley of the shadow of the death, your rod and staff are beside me. So that's what got me through the first night is the scripture I had learned, you know, in my foundation years. It would just run through my head in pieces. I just clung to my faith tightly as I could over, you know, the next months and years with my father, everything going on. I learned to like repeat scripture in my head or out loud. Like the Lord is my line, my salvation, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life, of whom shall I be afraid? You know, I've probably said that a thousand times in my head or out loud in over the last 14 years. He pled guilty in the summer of 05 and then was sentenced to 175 years in jail in uh, August of 05. He pled guilty, and so there wasn't a long, drawn-out trial, thankfully. It takes a long time to start coming to terms with what your father's done and actually believe it and then continue on in your life with it. I mean, early on, everyone in my family was in shock and disbelief. So several of us on my mom's side gathered together for a week um, in Kansas, um, trying to hide from the media, um, the national media that was, you know, after us with cameras and vans. We try to keep things as normal as possible, but you start questioning every memory of your life and you start wondering what you miss. I think it's been a different experience, say, for my mom and me, because I, was, I wasn't I was alive for seven of them. Um, but mom and I always said, like, even early on, if we had an inkling that my dad had harmed somebody, let alone murdered anyone, you know, that we wouldn't have stayed in the house. We would have gone to the police. My dad was, like, almost 95% of the time a really solid, decent, good husband and father. And, and there were times where he could be emotionally abusive. Um, and there were two times he was physically abusive with my brother. And when you're little and your dad's being a brute, you know, when you're real small, you just learn to adapt around him or follow what your mom's doing. In hindsight, you know, you look back and you realize you were just seeing the very tip of a very deep, insane iceberg. It wasn't really until long after he was arrested that I realized, you know, I had had domestic abuse in my house or that we had gone through emotional abuse. You know, I went through trauma in 05. So these weren't words I was familiar with or would have used in regards to myself. I grew up um, going to a Lutheran church. Um, It's the same church my mom had gone to since she was little. But I actually walked away from my faith in high school. So I was sort of rebelling against God and was even questioning his existence in my teenage years. When I was 18, we lost my cousin that was close to my age in a um, horrible Jeep accident out in Colorado. And um, she actually was had become a believer in college. I had seen like her Bible near her bed and her like a devotional and stuff. So I knew I knew she knew Jesus in a different way than I did, but I didn't get the chance to ask her before she passed away. So my first year of college, I fell into um, pretty deep hole of grief. I also lost my dad's father, my grandpa to leukemia, like four months later. So I was dealing with a lot, a lot of grief and loss, and I became depressed. And I didn't know I was struggling with depression, which is something, you know, I still struggle with now. I ended up on a six-day hiking trip with my dad to the Grand Canyon. In the Grand Canyon, it was this really intense trip. My cousin was along and my brother. And we got into way way more trouble than we should have with, like, not enough water you know, not making it to camp to get more water, like really dangerous, rocky trail. So when when I was down in the canyon, it was pretty much the lowest emotional and physical I'd ever been. Then I started like praying to God, which was probably the first time in my life I'd actually prayed to Him. 
and he started answering my prayers like he found a place for us to camp. You know, he got us water. There was this huge predicament that could have cost my brother his life, and he's like saved. He brought my brother back to my dad and me. Um, so I, this whole story is wrote in my book because it was important for me to show like not only doing something normal with my dad, which was hiking, but also show how my faith changed drastically in the canyon. I was almost 19 when I was down in the canyon. I prayed to God, you know, and I said I would accept his son and I asked for forgiveness and I said I would come back. You know, I almost I almost tried to make a deal with him that <laughs> if he would get me out of the canyon, I would come back. <laughs> When I got back to college, I started praying for like new friends and basically a new life. And I found um, a lot of solid people with Campus Crusade for Christ. And so I spent like the next several years in college deeply involved in that organization. And so that organization is what put the strong Christian foundation under me. I was only 26 when I lost my dad, you know, when he was arrested. But then when we got to Michigan, I was working on Sunday. So we kind of, you know, we drifted away again from the church because we were new here and didn't know anybody. God nudged us back to church in 06 and found us an amazing church here. Many churches, especially Lutheran ones um, all over the country, were reaching out to my mom's church and my family through the church. And they were sending cards and care packages for us. Um, somebody knitted my mom and me and my grandma blankets. Um, so then the the women at my mom's church gathered all this stuff up and shipped it to me and had wrapped several things, little things, and said, you know, each day open one, you know, just so you have something to look forward to the next day. Everybody kept saying, you know, we're praying for your family. And I still get that today. It's been 14 years and still today, you know, we've been praying for you for 14 years, your family. You know, we're going to keep praying for you, strangers, you know, people I don't know all over the whole country or the world. One of the gifts Carrie received during this difficult season of her life was a copy of Jesus Calling. She goes on to read a particular passage that is meaningful to her. My ministry leader had given me um, like the original devotional. So it was something, you know, I would pick up here and there. And usually when you picked it up, it did meet you. So Jesus Calling, May 29th, I am with you, watching over you constantly. I am Emmanuel, God with you. My presence enfolds you in radiant love. Nothing, including the brightest blessings and the darkest trials, can separate you from me. Some of my children find me more readily during dark times, when difficulties force them to depend on me. Others feel closer to me when their lives are filled with good things. They respond with thanksgiving and praise, thus opening wide the door to my presence. I know precisely what you need to draw nearer to me. Go through each day looking for what I have prepared for you. Accept every event as my hand-tailored provision for your needs. When you view your life this way, the most reasonable response is to be thankful. Do not reject any of my gifts. Find me in every situation. I think about the worst times in my life, you know, sort of just crying out, Abba, Father, like, when, when you, you, got, you, you don't have anything left, there's nothing in you, there's nothing, there's nothing left to hold on to, you know, that, that he, he's there quietly, always, always there, no matter what has happened. I've gone through extremely dark trials and dark days and dark years, and he's just walked alongside me through all of it. So you can argue with me about suffering and pain, but I know he, he's been there with me not so much even removing it as just being in it with you. It took almost 10 years before I became public with my story. For a long time, I was just praying after my father's sentencing for a quiet, private life. I would pray it over and over to God, like, please, just a quiet, peaceful, private life. The media finally went away. But it eventually became this thing that when I started speaking up, quietly, you know, in a group of, in a Bible study with women or in a small group with my husband, you could see the the positive impact it was having on people to share that you had been through hell and you still had your faith, you know, and, and then you could tell people that they can survive what they're getting through, whatever they're going through. 
when I was sharing with women's ministry and then in my in my MOPS group, my mother preschoolers group, you know, we, we paired up with the care ministry at church. And so we were able to help women that were currently in like domestic abuse situations with their children, get them help. So after I started being brave and speaking up, then I had women come to me and I was able to get a couple women to help. So I started seeing that even though it was difficult to talk about, it, it was having an impact on people. I get a lot of messages from, you know, people that have survived abuse and um, or have survived are crime victims or have a family member in their family that's a criminal. Um, I also get um, messages from war veterans that suffer from PTSD like I do. So these people started reaching out after I became public in 15. And then um, my pastor at our church, um, he was able to tie my story into Joseph and Genesis. And my life first had come out of that. Um, you know, you intended to harm me, but God is intended it for good for what is happening now, the saving of many lives. Stay tuned for more of our interview with Carrie Rawson and how she was finally able to forgive her father after this brief message about a beautiful new edition of Jesus Calling. Are you looking to introduce a friend or a loved one to the peace that can be found by spending time with God daily? There's a beautiful new edition of Jesus Calling that makes a gorgeous gift for someone who might be seeking a new perspective for a new year. It's the same Jesus Calling daily devotional that has inspired over 25 million readers, now updated with a lovely fabric cover and eye-catching foil with feminine floral touches. This elegant new version also features large text and written out scripture verses with each passage. For more information about this stunning new edition of Jesus Calling, visit jesuscalling.com slash botanical. That's jesuscalling.com slash botanical. Now, let's get back to the second half of our program. Welcome back. Carrie continues her brave, heartfelt testimony as she tells us how she found the strength to forgive her father. When my dad was sentenced um, to prison um, for 175 years, I actually shut off communication with him for two years. I had intended to keep writing him. I wrote him off in the first six months. Um, and when I wrote him the first six months, I told him, you know, that I still loved him and that God loved him and, and would forgive him if he asked for forgiveness. You know, I wanted to make sure he knew that. And, but in the sentencing, he said some things that, like, hard things about my family, calling his social contacts and pawns in his game. And between that and everything else that was coming out about his crimes and um, his double life and it just my I just shut down. I couldn't handle it anymore. So I basically just shut a gate on all of that for two years. Then I ended up in trauma therapy, um, mainly for anxiety and depression. But then I found out I had PTSD, and I didn't even know I'd been suffering from it for two years. So my trauma therapist worked with me for six months um, through just the basic initial like trying to continue to live with what I had and my dad. So she encouraged me to write him. I had become pregnant with my daughter and I wanted him to know he had a grandchild coming. But then I only wrote him one letter and then I pretty much shut down again trying to protect like this new baby growing in me. So I actually cut off communication for five more years with him as I sort of just threw myself into motherhood and church ministry. I knew forgiveness was an issue, like if I knew the pastor was going to talk about it or on a Sunday, I wouldn't go. <laughs> and I felt like here I am trying to say I'm a Christian, but I hadn't forgiven somebody, you know, and I, I would come up against that, you know, and knew like eventually God would ask me to work on it. So in the fall of 2012, I actually was reading about studying Joseph in a Bible study, and that's where I came upon that life verse. I had a stress fracture in my tibia. So I was laid up on the couch and I was like scooting after a one and a half year old and, you know, trying to get a four year old to preschool and, and, and trying to do ministry. And God just sort of put that big 
seized button on all of it and said, you know, you're on the couch for the next six weeks. And, and so there, you know, now I'm stuck there wrestling and stewing and everything. And that's where you really started working on my heart, you know, about forgiveness. And, and I ended up reading, you know, all the old letters my mom had cut, and my dad had wrote me, you know, so I was softening. And then, I mean, I had been to a movie with a friend in mid-December, and uh, I, I maybe because I always went to movies with my dad, I'm not sure. I don't even really think I was really thinking about him. But like I, I was stopped at a light and I just felt like a rush of light pour over me. And I, I was sobbing. Like I knew that hardness had been released and I had forgiven my dad. You know, that I was forgiving him for what he had done to me, the betrayal and the lies and what he put my family through that it's not my place to forgive him for what he did to the victims and their families. When I rushed home, I mean, I rushed up the stairs and told my husband, and then I sat down and wrote my dad like a six-page letter, and I hadn't spoke to him in five years. So at the bottom of the letter, then I told him I had forgiven him. After I forgave my dad, I would get mad again, and, you know, God would be like, he would point me to that verse, you know, as far as East is from West, we forgive, you know, and basically learning to forgive again and again as you proceed forward in a in an attempt at a relationship with a person. You know, it was not, I had to learn it wasn't just a one-time thing, you know, and that God, God forgives me again and again, so I need to let that, let that hardness out of me because it was, it was rotting inside me. And, and my husband said, when I let it go, I came back to Carrie, you know, and that I had been more like BTK's daughter for seven years and I came back to being Carrie after I let it go and it, w- it wasn't until I let it go that I could start talking about it and you know writing about it and sharing my story with others it, it was all just stuck in me until God shifted it with forgiveness I think it's important to remember sometimes you might just have to forgive somebody internally inside yourself you might not even be in a place where you're ever you're ever going to be able to tell them. Um, I have I have since I forgave my dad. I've learned about boundaries. Um, Clown Townsend's really amazing book. I have very firm boundaries set up between me and my father for my safety and my family's safety. So I think people people look at me and they say it's radical that you've forgiven your dad, and but then they question me for not you know visiting my father, which I've never done. So they don't understand how you can forgive someone and say you still love them, but not visit them. And, and, and I'm trying to say, like, there's, there's boundaries set up for the protection of my safety and sanity, you know, because my father's insane. So I, I still do communicate with him, but not very often because it's like talking to a crazy brick wall. There's nothing fixable about my dad. There's nothing fix, fixable about our relationship. The most, the most that we can have is is an occasional letter. So I think for anyone out there struggling with forgiveness, sometimes it's something you're just going to have to do within yourself. But you have to, it doesn't mean that you have to be back in relationship with somebody. And it's not even that you're forgetting it or you're saying it's okay because nothing my father did was okay. It's just letting that rot out of you and, and trying to move forward with your life. I think one other thing I, I hadn't shared was because because my dad was my father, I've really struggled against that God is your father and God's a loving father. And and I try to show that honestly in, in the book of wrestling for years with God, you know, coming up hard against that father. And God would have to remind me over and over again through study or sermon or devotional, you know, prayer time, like I'm good and I'm your father and I only mean good for you. You know, it took us, it took me a very long time to, to get there with him. You know, really after forgiveness was when we, I really did that really hard heart work with him, you know, of accepting God means good for me and not harm. And I could tell God was trying to like, tell me that all the way back to the Canyon. And then, you know, if you think of it as a little girl, God taking care of you. So, like, I still wrestle with him all the time, but I also know he's okay with it. 
You can find Carrie's book, A Serial Killer's Daughter, My Story of Faith, Love, and Overcoming, at your favorite book retailer today. Next time on the Jesus Calling Podcast, we speak with four authors who write love stories for a living and spend lots of time thinking about how we show love to people we cherish in all kinds of relationships. One of the writers we spoke with, Brenda Minton, tells us about the heroes we like to see on the page and in our own lives. We want to see heroes who are strong, who are chivalrous and caring about the people in their lives and and living their lives with faith. I think that speaks to people. I think that no matter what is going on in the world, we want to see people of action, people of faith reaching out. Do you love hearing great stories of faith each week via the Jesus Calling podcast? We want to hear from you. If you haven't already subscribed to the Jesus Calling podcast, visit the Jesus Calling page at iTunes.com and hit the subscribe button. While you're there, we'd love for you to leave us a review and tell us how you feel about the show and what future guests you'd love to see. Your reviews and subscription help us share these stories of faith to more people who need the hope and encouragement of Jesus Calling. If you have your own story to share, we'd love to hear from you. Visit JesusCalling.com to share your story today.